next episode of Great American Gardens, we'll visit a glorious garden on Henry Francis DuPont's Winterthur Estate in Delaware. The grounds are both wonderful and whimsical. A California garden that prides itself on its prickly nature, and no shrinking violets can be found on the grounds of this pretty pink house in Connecticut. It's all ahead on Great American Gardens. Welcome to Great American Gardens. I'm Tricia Springer. America was truly the land of opportunity for the DuPont family. Their fortunes gave them the opportunity to indulge their passion for extravagant gardens. Henry Francis DuPont spent more than half the 20th century turning his winter tour estate in Delaware into an artistic vision, a vision the public can enjoy today. At the Winter Tour Estate in Delaware's Brandywine Valley, nature is a work of art. And gardening is simply the subtle repainting of nature's canvas. In this living painting, it's always a different brush stroke that catches the eye. I see things for the first time many times, some design elements, some color combination, but I always find that this garden is vital for me. It's constantly changing and it's personally moving. At Winterthur, the landscape is woven into one unbroken tapestry in which patterns of color blend imperceptibly. Scenery is integrated from the most sweeping views to the smallest details. And child's play comes naturally in a garden made by woodland fairies. The Winterthur estate stretches over nearly 1,000 acres. The garden covers just a 60-acre fraction of that, yet one cannot be separated from the other. You have views to the farmland, the woodland, so we treat it as a totality, as one large landscape, but with different design experiences within that landscape. It was here in the Brandywine Valley that the DuPont family's American legacy began in the early 1800s. The DuPonts opened a gunpowder factory and bought several tracts of land, including the land that became Winterthur. In the late 1800s, Henry Francis DuPont, nicknamed Harry, grew up at Winterthur, where his mother shared with him a love of nature that shaped his life. For most of his life, Harry DuPont sought ways to merge nature and garden into one naturalistic landscape at Winterthur. He shared his passion for the natural art of gardening by opening these grounds to the public in 1952. Today, horticulturists are again on the path of Harry DuPont's vision. There's a bend in that path called Magnolia Bend, where the lush leaves of magnolias contrast with the slender leaves of a Japanese maple. In true DuPont style, Magnolia Bend is a study in natural harmony. Tall trees are balanced by short shrubs of rose hips and Russian sage and a carpet of blue plumbago. As you see in any woodland where you have a layer of wildflowers on the forest floor and then a layer of shrubs and then small trees, large trees, DuPont in this style of gardening embraced that same approach. DuPont not only embraced layering of plants, he also emphasized color themes, painted here in the subtle purples of the sage and plumbago. The brush of color themes touches all of Winterthur. In this patio near the reflecting pool, white and green create a cooling combination. The matches, uh, crepe myrtle is a much taller plant than the Diana Rosa Sharon. So we have our layers, we have our color combination of green and white, and we have repetition of color between two plants. DuPont once held parties in this garden where guests swam in the pool. and music flowed from a secret space hidden in the walls. The tunes came from these three bronze speakers, 
another element that DuPont made sure to blend into the scenery. And if you look closely, the grill work is done in a daisy design, which helps to further integrate the structural part with the garden. Up the path is another blend of the natural and the man-made that also adds a touch of magic. It's called the Enchanted Woods. We like to say the creation myth of this garden is that it's a garden made by woodland fairies for children. Even though the Enchanted Woods appeared in 2001, long after DuPont was gone, the fairies shared DuPont's dedication to natural designs. We wanted it in the middle of the garden. We wanted it to be a destination so that when families would come with their children, uh, that they would be in the garden. They would be surrounded by beauty. This is not just a playground. It's a garden that encourages imagination. In the enchanted woods, a child can become a king in the fairy cottage. Look for elves in the tulip tree house built from one of Winterthur's old hollow trees, or skip across the story stones. It's a spiral that was made from accumulated materials, garden materials, that had been at Winterthur for a hundred years. Old stone, fence posts, well heads. These objects are part of the enchantment that permeates all of Winterthur. It's the magic first stirred up by gardening artist Harry DuPont with his gentle brush strokes of blended colors and harmonious scenery. Winterthur is a garden scene painted onto nature in which it's difficult to tell where one ends and the other begins. When Great American Gardens returns, spines, needles, and bulging oddities make this California garden a marvelous collection of curiosities Next on Great American Gardens. Welcome back to Great American Gardens. During the summer months, Walnut Creek, California sees less than one inch of rainfall. It doesn't seem like enough to grow a healthy garden, but it's precisely the reason why this next public garden thrives. Brimming with prickly spines and tender succulents, the Ruth Bancroft Garden is an amazing living archive of desert and dry climate plants. So amazing that it was the first garden to be chosen by the Garden Conservancy, an organization dedicated to help preserve exceptional American gardens. Amid the oak-dotted grasslands of Walnut Creek, California, is one woman's visionary garden. Almost single-handedly, Ruth Bancroft has created one of the most celebrated dry climate gardens in the Golden State. The Ruth Bancroft Garden is a unique garden filled with water-conserving plants. Where a tree fills its belly with water, a plant provides needles, thread, and soap, and a cactus spins wool to keep away the sun. This three-acre garden represents an outstanding collection of plants from dry regions like Africa, Australia, and Mexico, areas that mimic the weather here in Walnut Creek. This rare garden is almost all that's left of the Bancroft Ranch, a 400-acre walnut and pear orchard that belonged to Ruth's husband's family. In the early 1970s, disease killed a patch of the walnut trees. My husband had to take the ball out. So we had a big flat area with nothing in it. And he said, would you like to put a garden here? So I said, yes. Ruth filled the new garden with her overflowing personal collection of succulents, a group of curious plants that intrigued and fascinated her. In 1993, Ruth decided to share her garden with the public. It's considered by some as one of the very best dry climate gardens in North America. Entering through an octagonal pavilion called Ruth's Folly, visitors are quickly enchanted by the bizarre shapes, textures, and colors of the plants. There are all sorts of greens and blue greens and yellow greens and 
And then, of course, almost everything here does bloom sometime in the year. At 93, Ruth is still tending to her colorful garden. She spends much of the day weeding, a chore that seems normal until you realize she's working knee-deep in thorns without gloves. I don't like to work with gloves. And I get stuck sometimes. <laughs> Undaunted, Ruth carries on, always accompanied by her faithful companion, Ginger. And while Ginger stares down a menacing plant, visitors are captivated by a gentle giant. This tree right here is the Queensland bottle tree, Brachychiton rupestris. And it's really a special tree because it has a fantastically swollen lower trunk. The extended trunk is the tree's way of surviving in its native arid region of Australia. When the rains come, they come heavy, and then there's a long period of drought afterwards, so this helps it to store water so it can tide it through until the next time. Another dramatic tree softens the landscape. The weeping mile rises 20 feet high, gracefully draping its gilded blooms to the ground. Even some of the succulents lend their own gargantuan proportions. The giant agave from Mexico is used to make needles, thread, and soap. It's an impressive plant. The leaves are about six feet long on it. The flowering stalk is probably about uh, 20 feet tall, so it really is quite a presence in the garden. Once it flowers, the plant dies and needs to be removed. It's a huge job. Sometimes if it's in the middle of a bed, we need to get a crane to hoist out the dead plant from the middle. Fortunately, they only flower every 15 or 20 years. Visitors can find year-round color and texture among the razor-sharp residents of the cactus garden. Here, the golden barrel cacti tumble onto the ground like fresh-picked apples, but don't gather these. Nature protects this bright cactus from extreme heat by wrapping it in thorns, thereby creating its own shade. Another unforgiving variety is the Old Man of the Andes. Its thorns are concealed under a full beard of bristly white wool that protects it from the sun's ultraviolet rays. The ever-present thorns can be intimidating at first, but visitors willing to look beyond the thorns are treated to what gardeners here call a cactile, tactile experience, one that takes some people by surprise. One woman told me, oh, our tour takes us to a cactus garden. And when she uh, had been through, she came up to me and said, I had no idea it was going to be like this, and I just love it. Unlike other gardeners, Ruth Bancroft has created a dry wonderland where plants make their own way without benefit of a watering can or hose. Where other gardeners might look at the desert and dream of a garden, Ruth Bancroft dreamed of a garden and created a desert. When we come back, a home and garden that don't shy away from color. It's just ahead on Great American Gardens. Welcome back to Great American Gardens. The Connecticut town of Woodstock is a living time capsule of the early 19th century. Woodstock remains virtually unchanged from the 1840s. White houses and a white church still surround the village green, while directly across the street sits a house of another color. You might say that it's pretty in pink. The pink house that is Roseland Cottage is a standout in this New England neighborhood. But the garden, far from being upstaged by the house, attracts attention in its own right. When visitors arrive and they see the garden for the very first time, I think they're amazed with the amount of flowers and the different patterns that the flowers create. It's quite spectacular, whether you're driving by, walking around the grounds, or viewing it from the second floor. A spectacular display of Victorian garden style confined within just a few hundred feet. But good things come in small packages, as the old saying goes. And at Roseland Cottage in Woodstock, Connecticut, this small garden is full of good things. One of the oldest boxwood gardens in New England. 
mature plants that are well over a hundred years old. And a mulch that's a chocolate lover's delight. Over 4,500 annuals sprout each year in this formal garden, about the size of an average front yard. Roseland Cottage, also known as Bowen House, was the summer home of textile merchant Henry Bowen. Bowen was also known as Mr. Fourth of July. The parties he held here attracted luminaries of the time, including Presidents Grant, Harrison, and McKinley. The gardens were first laid out in 1850 and were designed to complement the romantic architecture of the house. The gardens at Roseland Cottage invite you to come in and sit and relax. There are plenty of benches for people to sit on. We have a little garden house and there's many different ways to view the garden and to sit and relax as you would have done in the Victorian times. In addition to the array of colorful flowers, another pleasure of this garden is its sense of history. Henry Bowen kept wonderful records and fortunately they all came with the house and so we have the plant list that he used in 1850 so we know exactly what kind of plantings he ordered and how they were planted and we continue to plant those same types of flowers today. Begonias, salvia, and vibrant coleus are among annual favorites. All hemmed in by boxwood hedges Bowen planted in 1850. It's one of the oldest surviving boxwood parterres in the country. The um, parterre garden means pathways, so you can walk through the different pathways around the 21 flower beds, which are all outlined with that boxwood hedge. The garden is full of plants and trees planted by Henry Bowen more than a century ago. Lacy hydrangea blooms also have graced this property since 1850 and are a garden favorite. When the hydrangea blooms, that is such a showy plant, uh, especially the way it's planted in a ring. The blossoms are so big, and it's just a spectacular showing of a beautiful plant. At the other end of the garden, a cut leaf maple holds a prominent spot. One of the more interesting survivor plants that we have in the garden is our Japanese maple tree, and it's also called a cut leaf maple. The trunk of the Japanese maple is a beautiful branching effect. It almost looks like a bonsai, and it is pruned every year to encourage the umbrella-like growth that the tree provides. A special ingredient in the soil may be the secret to keeping these garden elders growing strong. This is the dry cocoa bean mulch that we use here at the beginning of the season. It's much lighter in color, but as the season progresses and it gets rained on, it turns this wonderful shade of dark chocolate brown. Also smells like chocolate, and it's great to keep the weeds down. With a name like Roseland Cottage, it may come as a surprise that there aren't many roses here. But no matter what time of year, there is always one rose in full bloom, the house itself. The main reason the Bowens chose pink was it was the color of their favorite flower, the rose. So the color scheme that they put together, the pink of the outside of the house mimics the petals, the brown for the stems of the flower, and the leaves are represented in the green shutters. The garden at Roseland Cottage has entranced presidents and more humble visitors for over 150 years. Carpets of vibrant color bordered by hardy boxwood hedges. The elusive hint of chocolate in the air and the presence of history make this public garden an ideal spot to indulge the senses. Next on Great American Gardens, a plant that takes its time. We'll revisit the Ruth Bancroft Garden in California to see the slow-growing Australian grass tree, a plant that takes 10 years to flower. Welcome back to Great American Gardens. Earlier, we visited the Ruth Bancroft Garden in Walnut Creek, California, where plants from four continents thrive in the California sunshine. One of the more unusual plants that grows there is a hardy survivor from the land down under. The 
Australian grass tree is common in Australia, but it's hard to find in American nurseries because it grows very slowly. It can take up to a year for a seed to germinate, up to 10 years before it flowers, and up to 40 years before it displays its trunk. This is one of the wonderful things in our garden, uh, the Xanthorea, or Australian grass tree. Um, you can see the grass part, the leaves uh, look like a tuft of grass. There's a trunk at the base, and uh, in Australia where they get hit by fires, then the trunk becomes blackened after the fire passes through. But in the end, if fire does indeed consume this plant, all's not lost. Fire is nature's way of releasing the seeds of the Australian grass tree. Thanks for joining us on our tour of Great American Gardens, and remember, public gardens are your gardens.